All right. Here it is, uh, one o'clock on the East Coast, um, Thursday afternoon. <laughs> Welcoming Stefan to uh, a much awaited presentation. It was almost a year ago when we, you know, had a big to do hua and, mm -hmm. and launched this project. And um, yeah, it, we're really happy to be able to share some of the preliminary data, which I think. I can say Stefan confirms what we ex expected it would, but it's much more comprehensive and significant. And I think you've said, you know, more samples, more compounds than ever has been done in the history of literature that you're aware of so far. And this is just our preliminary data. We'll have much more in person at the conference in December. Um, but yeah, Stefan Van Vliet, you know, uh, <laughs> Really, really honored to be partnering with him um, at Utah State and this work that really he's been um, developing over years with, of course, Fred and others as his as his mentors and teachers. But it's really exciting to be able to um, say things like, this is better beef, this is worse beef, this is somewhere in the middle. Um, we can say about carrots and spinach and wheat and oats and potatoes and beets more copper, more zinc, more polyphenols, but we can't really say better carrots, worse carrots. And with beef and now this work, I think we're getting to that point. So I'll, um, I think I'll just hand it off to you, Stefan. Do you need any other introductions or? <laughs> no, no, it's great. And uh, thank, thank you so yeah. much. Thank you all for, uh, for attending the, the webinar and those of you who will watch it later in, in recording. Um, yeah, indeed, uh, as we'll see in the data is that the main thing is the variation, I think. That was like the, the, the main, well, something we we're expecting, but also it's always interesting to see the, that uh, grass-fed isn't grass-fed and grain-fed isn't grain-fed. There's tremendous variation across the supply chain. And, uh, and I think we'll just dive into the data and, uh, and you all will, will see that. Um, we're gonna focus on nutrients, nutrient density, but from these analysis, we can also say something about uh, the, the health of the animal. Um, originally, I was trained as a, as a muscle physiologist and we sometimes do biopsies on humans. We take a piece of muscle out of them and we can say something about, uh, about their health, uh, muscle being the largest organ of the body. It gives a good indicator on the mitochondria, the cell of the life, glucose, metabolic health, uh, maybe oxidative stress. So those are some of the things that we can actually get from the muscle of an animal too, in, in this case, uh, meat. It gives clues to this. So. Those are the two things that, uh, that we'll focus on uh, most heavily on, on nutrient density uh, and, and what we find, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, plant compounds that get transferred from, from forage to animal. So I will share my screen with you all and we'll, we'll take it away. So the Beef Nutrient Density Project, uh, collaboration uh, with the Bionutrient Institute, but the many more partners, which I'll acknowledge at, at the end. Um, but the main study objective is to determine nutrient density in, in meat from over 250 farms. That's kind of the goal that we, we set ourselves. Uh, this will be 750 ribeye steaks. Oftentimes people ask, why did you choose ribeyes? Well, they are a very popular cut. Uh, they also have a nice layer of fat. So it, it a helps analytically and B, it is uh, uh, a very popular piece of meat uh, sold across, uh, across the US and, and elsewhere. Um, we're profiling grass-fed systems and grain-fed systems, basically get a whole spectrum. Uh, on one hand, uh, we have rotational grazing, we may have more continuous unmanaged grazing, but even grain-fed isn't grain-fed isn't grain-fed as well. We'll see there's, there's tremendous variation, but we are interested in linking these to causal factors in the end of management, uh, soil health and, and forage feed quality. And one thing that we're particularly interested in is uh, do more sustainable production practices, potentially uh, improve the nutrient density of meat. Oftentimes we hear the connection between healthy soils, healthy plants, healthy animals, healthy humans. Um, despite it intuitively making sense, there's not at present, a lot of systems research or data that links those all together. So the goal of this project is really to look at those. That's why we have farmers send in soil samples. As you can, uh, as you can see here in the, in the bottom, we, we get soil samples. We ask farmers to send in forage samples, which we'll analyze, and then also meat samples, which we'll analyze, and then 
we will also run a uh, series of human nutrition trials, which we're, we're starting actually now, with uh, where we talk about uh, if these actually differential compounds that we find in meat from different production systems, do they have an appreciable health effect on, on humans? And I must say it's very deep metabolic profiling that we're doing. Over 700 compounds is what we detected this round. Uh, fatty acids, phytochemicals, vitamins, minerals, amino acids, uh, bioactive compounds. One of the largest profiling of, of beef to, to date. And uh, so I must say it's a lot of data. So bear with me, but I will uh, try to explain it as uh, as, as uh, simple as I can, but uh, we certainly uh, spend a lot of time analyzing it and, uh, and digging through the data. So sample collection, this happens uh, by, the, by the farmer. There's a, a soil sample uh, that, is, that is being being taken by the farmer that's, that is uh, sent to uh, actually a, a lab in Michigan uh, through RSI and uh, we measured uh, or they measure total carbon, respiration, minerals, pH, extractable uh, minerals, available nitrogen, soil, organic matter. So a classic soil test that, uh, that we can see if there's a relationship between soil organic matter, uh, total exchange capacity, so which is an indicator of, uh, of the ability of, of, of plants to take nutrients up from the soil, as well as uh, various minerals, because obviously the plants uh, in many cases uh, have a symbiotic relationship with the soil and the animal, but in, in essence, the, the plants will get the nutrients from the soil, which can be, be upcycled into, uh, into animal source foods or, or in plants for direct human consumption, of course. Um, we're also collecting sample from uh, uh, various, like I said, we have total mixed ration samples that we analyze, which I'll present data on. We have uh, pastured samples um, that, that farmers collect through a pasture walk, we typically ask the farmer to collect a sample from their pasture that is representative of what the cow has access to in the last 30 days of their life. And this uh, is then essentially representing a feed sample or a forage sample that, uh, that we can then link to the nutrients that are in the meat. It seems especially from prior analysis that we've done, what you feed the animal in the last 90 to 120 days seems particularly important with regards to the compounds that you, you find in, uh, in the meat. So uh, put your animals on your best pasture in, uh, in the, last, uh, the last part of, uh, of, of their life is uh, sort of what, we are, uh, uh, what we're finding. Um, sample collection, also stool, we're interested in the gut microbiome of the animal. More diversity, uh, potentially certain bile acids that have more anti-inflammatory effects. So, we can, by collecting stool samples from the cattle, we can also study the health of their gut microbiome. There's been a lot of interest in the gut microbiome when it comes to human health, um, but I always jokingly say that we are not that different uh, from, from uh, other mammals, at least on a molecular level. So we are looking at the gut microbiome and the health of, of the animal as well, and uh, various gut bacterial species and, uh, and, and bile acids, uh, typically markers of alpha and beta diversity. And then obviously sample collection of, of meat samples. Uh, this is where we profile over 700 compounds for nutrient density and animal health. And what I'll present to you today is particularly focused on, uh, on what we find in, in the meat in our initial analysis of, uh, of about uh, 100 uh, samples that we have. So the study workflow, when the samples arrive in, in our labs, in our case, the, the meat arrives here at Utah State University, we, we process the sample, we uh, unfortunately defile the ribeye steak by, by grinding it up and uh, grinding it up into a fine powder, which we, we, we then can analyze. Um, we go through a series of extraction steps and, and use what is called a mass pack. What a mass spec can do is, is it can identify a large number of compounds. So we would have the sample analyzed. We analyze the sample for about an hour or so or 75 minutes. And during that time point, it identifies a number, a large, large number of compounds. Uh, these are amino acids, phytochemicals, fatty acids, and it gives us an indicator of, of, of the nutrient density of the meat and, and the health of, of the animal. 
So metabolite identification, we have software procedures to go through that, we analyze them, and then we do data interpretation uh, based on a variety of, of compounds that, uh, that I'll me measure or mention uh, throughout the, uh, the presentation. And I think what's super important to realize here is that typically, as a consumer, when we pick up a uh, uh, meat in, in the grocery store or, or even if in direct consumer, the nutrition facts panel, as you can see here, is uh, not telling that full story. We display only 13 nutrients routinely on nutrition facts panels. Um, as you can see here, protein, uh, total fat, and then saturated fat, and then a handful of vitamins and minerals that appear on nutrition facts panels. Now, the food matrix contains hundreds to thousands of bioactive compounds that can impact human health and metabolism. As I mentioned, fatty acids, amino acids, bioactive compounds, phytochemicals, they impact the, the human metabolome. So the compounds that circulate in our blood and determine our risk uh, for, for diseases and can improve our health. And they interact with what we call the nutrigenome. The nutrigenome, is essentially uh, related to disease-related gene expression. So the foods that we eat actually is the main determinant of what circulates in our blood. About 50% of what circulates in our blood is directly tied back to the foods that we eat. And uh, more so than anything else, physical activity, uh, sleep, our microbiome. And that of course makes sense if you think about it, given that we eat three times a day, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less, that that is the main thing that impacts uh, our health. And this is at least also a unique opportunity for us to improve our health um, by choosing the, the foods that, uh, that we do and, and, and eat. Um, but it is important to note is that a lot of what I'll talk to you uh, today about is the hundreds of compounds that do not appear on this nutrition facts panel, but can impact our metabolism and health. I'll talk a little bit about the vitamins and, and minerals that we measure, but we also measure a wide array of, of other compounds that we know impact our health, but, uh, but are not always uh, uh, clear to the consumer, which I think in part is also why uh, uh, in, in the past, at least if we see, if we measure for grass-fed beef and grain-fed beef, we detect no noticeable difference in protein content. We detect no noticeable difference in total fat content, but the type of fatty acids are very much different. So that is important that, uh, to, to note, and uh, that is what we'll, we'll jump in next. So nutrient density, the term nutrient density broadly refers to, let's say if we have uh, four ounces of meat, it's the amount of, of nutrients that are in there. Uh, these are oftentimes, uh, let's say if we do, think phytochemicals, if there's more phytochemicals in that meat, we could consider it to be more, more nutrient dense. If there's uh, certain other bioactive compounds in it, that could be a measure of nutrient density. So it typically refers to, uh, to micronutrients in there as opposed to macronutrients. The phytochemicals that we uh, are, are talking about here, uh, which I'll start with is phytochemicals are essentially, the word phyto is plant. So they're plant derived chemicals. Plants respond biochemically to sunlight, moisture, nutrients, uh, soil, other plants, and herbivores by producing phytochemicals. And, and what is really interesting is that sort of the competition between herbivores and plants over time have, have led to a wealth of, of compounds that, uh, that appear in, uh, in, in the forage that at moderate amounts can provide uh, benefits to the animal and potentially also, also to us, what, uh, what typically domesticated, but also wild herbivores do, especially when they have access to a great deal of biodiversity, they're able to self-select the compounds that they need to uh, uh, both prophylactically, so preemptively uh, nourish themselves as well as uh, use it for, for medicinal purposes. And uh, these phytochemicals, they have a potentially anti-inflammatory effects, antibacterial effects, antioxidant effects, now, I must say that this has been predominantly studied in the context of, uh, of uh, laboratory-based models. So uh, let's say in, in a Petri dish or in, in animal models, in rodent models, also in, uh, in cattle. Um, it is a new area of interest uh, in, in human nutrition. Um, but uh, 
with further advancements of, of mass spectrometry and metabolomics, which is the technique that we use to look at these large number of metabolites, we are beginning to understand that there's probably tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of these compounds that are uh, transferred from, from potentially the forage into the meat, into us, or obviously directly from uh, plant consumption, from plants that we can consume. Now, what is particularly unique about these phytochemicals is that the animal can consume vegetation you and I cannot consume. For instance, I was recently in a, in a farm in Idaho in Alder Spring Ranch, and, um, which is in, in the mountains. So it's a, bear, a very biodiverse pasture. And as, as the farmer was, uh, was, was telling me is that uh, the animal searches out, uh, seeks out certain plants that we know have medicinal effects, but we cannot safely consume them. But if the animal consumes them, that could be another way for us to getting unique compounds that we would have otherwise uh, not have access to. Uh, these are things as terpenes, phenols, tocopherols, and, and carotenoids. So uh, in our initial round of analysis, we uh, have identified uh, 29 major phytochemicals. Um, and if we sum those, we came up with a, with a total phytochemical score. So that is what uh, the data is that you're looking at here. <coughs> As you can see here, the first thing that pops out is the incredible variation among samples. The total phytochemical score, in some cases, may be up to uh, 150. And normally I would consider it as an outlier. And this is also the reason why we typically ask people in, to send in three ribeyes, because if this farm had sent in only one ribeye, then I would have thought, well, Maybe that's an outlier. It seems extremely high, but all three stakes in this case were from uh, uh, from the same farm, which uh, uh, at least makes me uh, makes me feel comfortable about the data, which was which was very high. Um, as you can see here, on average, grass fed beef uh, had a total phytochemical score of uh, thirty seven point six, and it was about twofold higher than the grain fed uh, animals. So this is uh, either uh, samples that we collected from, from feedlots that we work with or uh, off-the-shelf beef. So there's definitely still phytochemicals in grain fat, but consistent with previous work that we have found, and, and that is always nice when we start to look at this in a broader database, but when we did previous comparisons of uh, a select number of farms, we found that they were about twofold higher, two and a half fold higher, and it, that's data that we seem to be replicating here. But something I do want to point you out, and this is at least to me very interesting, is that the incredible range, the lowest phytochemical score in grass-fed beef was 17, but it went all the way up to 146. So, which means there was a, a 9x variation. And as Dan talked about earlier, this was something that uh, uh, within the, the Bionutrient Institute, they had previously seen in, in carrots as well and, and other crops. And we are seeing that now in beef too. So the interest now is, is what is causing some of this uh, variation. As you can see with, with grain fat, we also have a little less samples, a lot less, but the range is, is, is typically a little bit more tighter. And that is probably because of the standardization also of the, of the total mixed ration, which is oftentimes a combination of uh, hay and corn. Uh, most of the samples that we have in here were, uh, were corn-based total mixed rations. So, some uh, grain fed samples may be better than grass fed samples, but overall grass fed samples were, were twice as high with an, uh, with an incredible depth in, in variation. So here is a little bit uh, further zoomed in. The reason why I, uh, why I did that is uh, because we had samples of all the way up to 150, but most of the samples fall in uh, around the average here of 37.6. And here you can see the, the integral variation. These are all individual data points that, uh, that, that we found. And, uh, but oftentimes what we did find is that the three stakes that farmers send in from the same farm, from the same herd, uh, oftentimes those were uh, fairly close to each other, but still we see variation within the animal. And of course, uh, we noticed from especially uh, research from uh, various animal scientists like, uh, like Dr. Provenza, uh, one of the collaborators that uh, no animal eats the same things. Uh, no two animals eat the same thing. And uh, it's the same really with, uh, with humans, animals uh, and, and humans, they 
we're able to, to select the, the different diets and, uh, and we see slightly different variation. Though we must also uh, note that obviously the pasta composition is going to have a big impact on, uh, on, on this, this phytochemical score. With the, uh, earlier, what we're seeing right now is, um, and we'll have obviously need more data. I know I sound like a scientist now that also says we need more data, but our initial data would at least suggest that we uh, see an, a benefit for, for biodiversity with, with more biodiverse pastures typically resulting in higher phytochemicals. But it's also important to note that seasonality plays a role here too. Um, during the, the spring and, and, and summer, uh, early fall, typically the forages are uh, more lush and richer in these phytochemicals. Obviously with winter feeding, depending on where you're at, there might be hay feeding, which we know uh, decreases the phytochemicals uh, uh, somewhat. The reason being is because hay contains less phytochemicals than fresh forages. So those are all important things that, uh, that we, uh, we will tease out uh, in, in the future. But we, we can see that there's a difference between grass fed and grain fed. So, and I think that's so important also to note is that this does not appear in the nutrition effects panel. So oftentimes uh, you hear, well, there's no real difference between beef from different production systems, but that is because we only look at maybe protein or total fat. And indeed there's no difference there, but once you drill deeper into several hundred compounds, you can see differences uh, appear. And, um, that's also what we're, what we're seeing is beef isn't beef isn't beef. So here I've plotted all the individual data points in, in a different way. And as you can see here, um, when we go further uh, up and further out, we can definitely see that the, the grass fed samples um, become further enriched in, in phytochemicals. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a 9x variation in, in here. Uh, so within the grass fed samples, within the grain fed samples, there's still a, a 2x variation. and uh, in, into what the animal was fat. And later on, I'll, I'll show you why, uh, why I think that is. And it's, it's, it's partly due to the amount of corn that the animal is fat because hay contains still a good amount of phytochemicals, less than forages, but corn further uh, reduces the phytochemicals. Interesting and love though, is that, and, and we're working with, uh, uh, um, trying to work with groups here that also feed more phytochemically rich agri-waste, so potato peels or almond hulls and things like that, which we know are rich in phytochemicals and could potentially increase the phytochemicals in, in grain-fed beef. So if we look at the individual phytochemicals, here on the right, we have various phytochemicals. So phytochemicals, they're broadly antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. Um, now I do want to highlight here are specific ones, hyperate, catechol sulfate, 4-ethylphenyl uh, sulfate, which are common phytochemicals. Those were uh, twofold and up to 19 and a half fold higher in grass-fed beef. Um, we do know something about their health benefits, mainly from work in a laboratory-based setting. So in a Petri dish, let's say we throw some hyperate on, on, on cancer cells or catechol sulfate on cancer cells that may be reduced uh, expression of these cancer cells. That's how uh, we know some of the health benefits, but I do want to highlight, and this is very important, is that this does not per se mean that eating grass-fed beef reduces your risk of cancer. That's not what I'm saying at all. So I think that's, uh, that's very important uh, uh, to note, but looking at broadly some of the health benefits, we knew, do know that uh, uh, these could have uh, certain health benefits, antioxidant uh, benefits, but this is something that needs to be studied more in the context of grass-fed beef or grain-fed beef for that matter as well, because it could be lower, but it doesn't mean that uh, grain-fed beef is per se uh, uh, unhealthy for you to consume. I, I think there's uh, many benefits and we know that grain-fed beef still provides many important nutrients. What we're just seeing is, is that there's additional potentially health promoting compounds that get incorporated into, uh, into grass-fed beef from feeding phytochemically rich forages. Um, these plant phenolic compounds, they go through a series of, of steps uh, that are metabolized within the animal and, and start to enrich uh, a large number of, of compounds. And I think this is really important to note is that the discovery that various phytochemicals become enriched is definitely something in, in at least in North American rumens that is a newer concept. And uh, um, that's why 
we need to study more on whether this will uh, uh, differentially impact uh, health effects. But what we cl clearly see here so far is that these phytochemicals with potentially important health effects become further enriched. Now, we did find that two phytochemicals in particular, uh, uh, piperine, which was first isolated from black pepper, hence the name, was slightly higher in uh, grain fat samples. So the full difference here is uh, grass divided by grain. So essentially, it means that this was slightly higher in grain. Phagamine, which we know is rich in corn, phytochemical, is uh, also slightly higher in the, in the grass, in the grain fat samples. Anything in blue, though, is higher in the grass fat samples. Uh, cinnamon or glycine, uh, named after cinnamon, cinnamic acid is where this compound was first uh, isolated. Uh, it's also a compound that has potentially uh, anti inflammatory effects, as we'll see on the next slide. Uh, cinnamon or glycine, um, as you can see here, was about uh, twofold higher. Another anti-inflammatory compound has been linked to a decreased risk of Parkinson's disease and various cancers. But again, we cannot say that uh, grass-fed beef would uh, per se reduce your risk of that. There's a thousand other things that could impact that and lifestyle factors, but at least it's encouraging to see that uh, some of these health promoting, potentially health promoting phytochemicals become enriched in the grass-fed beef. And this was particularly interesting, uh, ergothionine, which is a compound that we looked at. It's been particularly looked at in soil fungi and in mushrooms. It is produced by soil fungi, and we see that this also becomes a rich now in grass-fed beef. And I think that relates to the, the fact, the, the sort of the food web, the interaction between the soil fungi, the, the plants, and, and the animals. And we see this upcycling effect. And this could potentially also be uh, uh, because some of the, the, the dirt that the animals eat or potentially through the plant, but that we see this being enriched even in the meat, that we can measure this in the meat uh, was, was particularly uh, uh, interesting, I thought, and, and something that I had not expected per se. Um, Stachydrine is another compound that is rich in, in typically things like clover, uh, that is rich in alfalfa, and we also see this being enriched in, in the grass-fed beef. But uh, as I said, we can detect still all of these things in, in the grain-fed beef. And that's why I also want to highlight is that there's a transfer from forage to animal. If we look at this uh, pathway, a simplified pathway of what happens to plant phenolic compounds, benzoate is something that we measured in the forages. So if we uh, step back for a second, I remember I said we also analyzed the plant samples that the, that the farmers send in. This forage, we found the compound benzoate, another common phenolic acid, which was uh, about five-fold higher in forage than in corn-based total mixed ration. Benzoate can get metabolized to hypurate. Hypurate is a major indicator of uh, phenolic intake. In humans, it is associated with improved gut microbial diversity. Uh, it may have anti-inflammatory effects. And what we're seeing here is that we see this transfer, it being higher in the forage, it, to it being higher in the meat. And here we see it uh, being lower in corn-based total mixed ration and also being lower in grain fat. The difference between forage and corn-based total mixed ration is typically higher. Um, and this is what the next slide illustrates too is that this is the total secondary metabolites, so the total phytochemicals that were found in the four examples of the beef. What we typically find is, is that these, these were around 4,000, whereas here there are only, uh, I think, three or 400. So they are tenfold higher in the four examples, the phytochemicals. So they're sort of a, a, a wash out effect where when animals uh, go from, uh, Forage, forages during even, of course, with grain finishing, there's a cow calf uh, phase, there's a stalker phase, and typically they're finished for three to four months in a feedlot on corn based ration. So I think the reason why we find a twofold higher difference in the meat, but about a tenfold higher difference in the forages, is because what we're seeing is, and then we've seen this in the past too, when the animal goes into the feedlot, you see this decrease of phytochemicals, which is because 
the uh, Ptolemaic ration is, is uh, lower in phytochemicals, but because the animal has spent a large part of its life on pasture, it probably starts off fairly phytochemically rich because the animal is consuming forages. And again, it's important to note here is that with increased biodiversity, we typically see uh, uh, more of these plant secondary metabolites appearing just because different plants contain different, different phytochemicals. Um, for instance, a, a mixture of different class, grasses and legumes uh, or the farmers that maybe have uh, five, six species as opposed to a monoculture pasture of one or two species typically show higher amounts of these phytochemicals. So this is what we're finding. And also important to note is that the phytochemicals that we find in the corn-based total mixed ration are predominantly the result of the hay portion of the total mixed ration because what we did was we also uh, analyzed corn samples and these corn samples were actually uh, from farms that were very close to where we collected several forage samples. So this is uh, some of these corn samples that are in here are, uh, was, were adjacent to farms from which we collected forage samples. In that case, we could isolate or at least uh, isolate the effects of the, the feed and not so much uh, the environmental effects because lots of times we were able to collect a pasture sample uh, within a mile from a cornfield. So we would go to the farm, collect pasture samples, and then find the nearest cornfield, oftentimes only a mile away from the pasture, and collect corn samples there. And as we can see here, you can barely see it, but there is a little bit of, of uh, phytochemicals in, in corn or, or secondary metabolites, I should say, um, these plant secondary metabolites in corn. Um, but in the total mixed ration, uh, we see that they're higher. So the most reasonable explanation is, is that this is the result directly of the hay portion. But what we do have seen also in the past is that when you harvest, uh, let's say alfalfa or, or other uh, grasses, and uh, uh, they are they are built and then or turned to silage, that we see this decrease. Now, I know there's no way around it. In the, oftentimes in winter feeding, right when the fresh forages disappear, especially in uh, more northern latitudes, also where where we're at, there is uh, uh, some decrease in phytochemical richness. So. We typically see a seasonal effects too, where there is sort of an increase over the, uh, the spring months and it remains high in the summer uh, and then in the early fall and then goes down again during the winter. So for farmers, that is, uh, that's not per se something that, uh, that, that is a bad thing or something that uh, uh, we have to, uh, it's, it's just a natural cycle, but it's important to, to be aware and, and probably why in, uh, in, in the past, we, uh, we slaughtered oftentimes in the fall, but having a, a meat supply uh, year round, of course, is, uh, is, is something that's more common now. But if you, it is important to know that typically the, the fall, uh, spring and summer slaughter is gonna be a little bit more phytochemically rich in, in meat. Um, now the relationship with soils, as I said, we are trying to connect this back to soil health. And, focus here predominantly on the nutrient density, but I do want to want to note this is that on the previous slide, I showed you the corn sample and, and the pasture sample. So we collected samples from pasture, and this is sort of a subset of the data from our USDA project where we, uh, we looked at this in, in, a, in a number of farms. So what we did was we collected soil from the pasture and we collected soil from the nearest cornfield that I just presented you the data on. In this case, we can isolate uh, management factors here in that case. So the corn, of course, not all of it goes to, uh, to animal feed, it's being sold into the commodity market, it can go into bioethanol, it can go some of it into maybe like high focus corn syrup, but a good part of it will, will go into uh, uh, animal feed. So this was basically a model of if the land is in pasture or if you have a monoculture cornfield, how does that impact the, the, the soils? And what is the relationship with the forage and the, uh, uh, the phytonutrients that we find in the meat. So when the um, soils were in pasture, we typically find uh, that this builds more soil organic matter. What was interesting is that a lot of these pastures that we studied here were previously degraded uh, 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 crop fields. 
but they have been increasing in, in soil organic matter, as we can see. Uh, total exchange capacity, the, the ability of, of plants to obtain nutrients from, uh, from the soil, this is really what the what an in, a potential indicator of that is. Uh, it trended to be higher as well. And then various uh, minerals such as zinc, iron, phosphorus, and potassium were also higher. And so that can represent a potential explanation, which in the previous slides we saw why there's more plant secondary metabolites because these plant secondary metabolites are produced through metabolism of the plant. And the plant obviously obtains its nutrients uh, from, from the soil into a large uh, part and is able to uh, produce uh, more of these, uh, of these metabolites as opposed to corn. And uh, the corn was also oftentimes, uh, we picked that fresh, so, and froze it immediately. Moving on to the next part then, vitamins and minerals. We've looked at a number of vitamins and minerals in uh, um, the samples. And what I wanna highlight here is vitamin A, retinol. So, there's uh, carotene as uh, so carotenoids, which are precursors to vitamin A, but true vitamin A is, is retinol, and that uh, appears only in animal source foods. So we measure true vitamin A here, retinol. Very interesting data, again, is that uh, the average was a little bit higher, but again, look at this incredible variation amongst, uh, amongst samples. Uh, the range here from 0.4 to 5.2, whereas the range was a lot tighter in uh, uh, the... The, the feedlot samples. And again, I think this points to uh, uh, that there's considerable variation across the supply chain in grass-fed beef. And, and that makes sense, of course, you're dealing with, with pasture, there's different pastures, different practices, whereas uh, perhaps in a sort of more of a, a feedlot type scenario, there, what we're at least finding initially, and, uh, and others have made these findings too, is that there's obviously a little bit more tighter control in there. So you have less variation among samples. And this is what we're seeing here. Um, vitamin E, alpha tocopherol. Alpha tocopherol is rich in fresh forages. So we see that this is uh, about one and a half fold higher in the grass fed uh, beef. Again, with a range of 0.2 to 3.7. So again, there's a range. And uh, again, this is directly related to the alpha tocopherol content in the forages, as I'll show you in a little bit, um, with grain fed samples being lower. But as you can see, some grain fed samples may be higher than grass fed samples, depending on, uh, on uh, what they were fed. And I think, or I know from the data that we've shown that I think this is also potentially a residual effect. These animals likely started uh, with uh, higher amounts of, of alpha tocopherol before they went into, uh, into the feedlot and uh, there was a slight uh, decrease. Um, also, there is uh, gamma tocopherol, another form of tocopherol that is in uh, grain that can be converted by the liver to alpha tocopherol, but alpha tocopherol is the, is the main usable form for humans. So typically having more alpha tocopherol in, in meat could be considered a, a beneficial thing, but certainly plant foods are a rich source of these as well. Um, alpha tocopherol has potent antioxidant effects. It's important for immune function and heart function. Now, this was interesting. Please note the sample up here. Retinol, vitamin A, it's a fat soluble vitamin. And this is data from an age year old bull that we, that we got from one of the farms. He was uh, slaughtering an age year old bull. And fat soluble nutrients, they turn over very, very quickly or accumulate, or very slowly, I should say. They take a lot of time to accumulate. And this was also one of the most orange steaks I've ever seen, suggesting there's a lot of carotenoids and retinol in here uh, in, in this age year old bull. And, that's why this is an outlier, just because it had uh, lots of time to, to slowly accumulate retinol and fat. And I don't know if any one of you has ever had steak from uh, an old dairy animal. Those are typically very, very uh, orange in, in the fat. And it's probably because of the carotenoids and, and the retinol that, uh, that we found here. So that was uh, certainly an interesting side finding. And uh, I think a reasonable explanation for that. Now, Perhaps I'm, I'm, I'm beating the drum here again, but uh, cows are what they eat. That makes sense, right? Um, if we uh, put two uh, groups of, of humans in a, on a very much different diet, right? So that's just, it's just to highlight why oftentimes people think there's no difference between grass-fed and grain-fed animals. And I think it's important to note though, is that 
it's because we haven't looked as deeply in some of these compounds. Um, but let's say if we are in, 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 my, in my lab, uh, we do work with humans, we put humans on diet A or diet B that are very much different, we would expect a different health outcome in humans. When we put lab rodents on, let's say a Mediterranean type diet or a, a standard American diet, we would expect very much differences. Well, when you put cows on two very much different diets, then we also see differences. Uh, we see this across across mammalian species, which uh, uh, I think that has not been uh, appreciated perhaps enough, but it does make sense if you put an animal on two very much different diets that you get uh, very much different nutrients in there. So we see alpha tocopherol here being higher in uh, the grass-fed samples, but again, large variation. And this actually correlated well with the alpha tocopherol in the forages. So higher amounts in the meat, higher amounts in uh, the forages. We almost detected no alpha tocopherol in the total mixed ration samples. So the reason why this difference is, is uh, not as large as this is, obviously, between the forages is because I think what we're seeing here is that those initial uh, 14 months, 16 months on pasture uh, is contributing to these amounts still being present in grain fed samples. And, uh, so I think that's that's very important to, to note as well uh, that, that the initial period is accumulating a lot of uh, a lot of phytochemicals from the forages, but it also makes me feel comfortable about uh, that the data is likely indicating that more forage phytochemical richness is what's driving this uh, response because this is in the total mixed ration we can barely detect any of uh, of this uh, um, vitamin precursor. We know. Meat is a rich source of B vitamins and a main reason why, why, why we consume uh, uh, meat. And what we're seeing here in, in the B vitamins, we are also seeing some of these uh, uh, differences. So we found higher uh, mineral content, like you said, cobalt and other compounds that in, in the soil that uh, could potentially be, be related to this. And uh, we see that vitamin B2, it's an important antioxidant. B vitamins are essential vitamins. They help metabolize nutrients in our food. They're important for protein metabolism, uh, fat metabolism, cholesterol metabolism, so turning our food into nutrients. Again, here we find uh, differences. Uh, again, note uh, considerable variation among samples, but training with, uh, with broad strokes, we see that this is higher in, uh, in grass-fed samples, but certainly some grain-fed samples are, are again higher than, uh, than the lowest uh, grass-fed samples. Here we see a trend also for uh, vitamin B3 to be higher, but again, uh, note the, the large range here uh, between, uh, between samples. Um, typically, B vitamins, they're rich in legumes, uh, alfalfa, clover, birch fruit tree four, which may help explain these findings and having uh, legumes in, uh, in, in the pasture where possible is, uh, I think, uh, contributing to, uh, to some of this work, at least as our initial data would suggest. Vitamin B5, pentothenate, and vitamin B6. Um, vitamin B5 was actually higher in the uh, grain-fed samples. The explanation is, is that we know vitamin B5 is rich in corn. It's also rich in legumes. So um, here the grain-fed samples were, were higher, which also suggests that you know, there, there may be some uh, benefits to, to byproduct feeding of, of grain on, uh, on pasture, for instance, which could, uh, could, could have benefits. Or, um, but in the grass-fed samples that we see here, especially uh, uh, pastures rich in legumes, we see that there's uh, uh, still a considerable amount of vitamin B5. And then vitamin B6, uh, no differences in, the, in, in our data so far. Um, and uh, then amino acids, protein. So, Remember earlier on in the slide, I talked about protein content and that if we simply look at a nutrition facts panel with protein, fat, a handful of vitamins and minerals, then maybe these differences may not uh, become very clear. We do indeed know from previous research and we found the same thing too. There's no differences in uh, amino acids, uh, in total amino acids. And this, these are essential and non-essential amino acids. So in line with a long history of literature, we find no differences between grass-fed and grain-fed in terms of protein, uh, which is often, I think, a reason why uh, 
there's a consideration that there's no differences uh, between the two uh, based on, on the limited amount of nutrients. But um, as we can see here uh, with, and this is particularly interesting, I thought, is that taurine, taurine is named after uh, taurus, after uh, cattle, because its amino acid was first isolated in cattle. And this is something we find in the past too, and I'm finding this in a larger data set as well, is that taurine is higher in grain fat samples. I don't really have an explanation for it is at the moment, um, but it is something we've observed before. So something to, that we need to look further into and, and try to understand. Um, taurine is important for cell growth, energy metabolism. It is also an antioxidant. And as you can see here, typically within the spread too, we can see that there's, the samples are, are trending uh, towards being higher. While it was statistically significantly higher, but also many samples are already found to be higher in uh, in the grain fat versus the grass fat samples. So uh, certainly something that's interesting to look at. And as you can see here, uh, it is certainly not always black and white that uh, 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 grass fat is always more nutrient dense than, than grain fat. It also depends on some of the nutrients that you look at. But moving on to the omega-3 fatty acids in meat. Um, this has been well established. Omega-3 fatty acids typically become enriched in grass fat animals. Alpha linoleic acid or ALA is an uh, omega-3 fatty acid, uh, very rich in forages. Um, and uh, DHA and EPA are other essential uh, fatty acids. Alpha linoleic acid through a series of uh, elongation steps is, uh, is, is, gonna, is uh, interesting to revert into EPA and DHA. These are also well known to occur in uh, in fish, in fatty fish, but we can also detect them readily in animal source foods. And work suggests that they can contribute meaningfully to the amounts of EPA and DHA that circulate in our blood. Now, we as humans are not as efficient in uh, converting uh, alpha linoleic acid to DHA and EPA, though we certainly can. Uh, but having a direct source of these is important and uh, um, or could potentially be important or provide additional health benefits, I should say. DHA and EPA are technically non-essential because we can convert some of it, but the question here is, is minimal amounts versus optimal amounts. And I think the literature would suggest that having a higher intake of DHA and EPA is uh, important for our health. They are anti-inflammatory, they are antioxidants, um, they may help lower the risk of, of, of getting certain diseases and are associated with reduced risk of heart disease and cancer, uh, liver diseases, and as well as improved cognitive function. Uh, more of these is typically considered favorable for, for human health. And then a thing that we often look at or the way that we express it is an omega-6 to 3 ratio. So this is the omega-6s divided by the omega-3s. Um, an omega-6 to 3 ratio, I mean, considered under 4 is considered more favorable. There's not really a hard cutoff of that, but uh, um, this is typically what at least historical human diets are presumed to have been that we have an omega-6 to 3 ratio of 1 to 4 in our diet. At the, with our standard American diets, on average, we have an omega-6 to 3 ratio of like 1 to 15 or 1 to 20. So if there's ways that we, we can increase our omega-3 intake in our diet, that is certainly a good thing. What we see here with the grass-fed samples, again, uh, a large variation with some of the grass-fed samples having a worse omega-6 to 3 ratio than some of the grain-fed samples, which is it's, it's very interesting, and um, I can only speculate as to, as to why that is, but uh, um, certainly some uh, grass-fed samples will look like grain-fed samples. And, uh, but what we typically see from, from our data uh, looking at it is that several farmers with biodiverse pastures, uh, good rotational grazing practices, they reach a level of, of one, which is sort of considered the, the holy grail, although I must admit that I am doubtful whether if you have a ratio of two to one or one to one, whether that one to one ratio is much better or healthier than two to one. Typically just a, a low ratio of around that uh, two to one, three to one, one to one, I think could be considered uh, uh, favorable. But this means they have more omega uh, six to three ratios in, in their meat. So if we look at this ratio of uh, four to one, which again is a little bit of an arbitrary uh, cutoff, but, but it's based on what is typically thought that was a historical intake, we see that this ratio is only found in uh, grass-fed animals with some reaching uh, 
an omega-63 ratio of, of 1.0, but a large number of these, these compounds uh, or, or grass-fed samples fell on, on the spectrum, what uh, we typically consider to be a, a very favorable ratio. And I do want to highlight, and I think this is also very important, and this was also sort of an aha moment for me. We know that forage feeding increases the uh, omega-3, so the polyunsaturated fatty acids, the very long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids get enriched in the grass-fed beef samples. When we were looking at this data, we saw the same thing happening to these very long chain saturated fatty acids. And I think this has been less recognized and less talked about in the literature is because we typically consider saturated fat as something that is uh, uh, not healthy for us. And, and, but there's a large number of different types of saturated fatty acids. And what is interesting is that these long chain saturated fatty acids, they're associated with the, actually a decreased risk of cardiovascular disease in epidemiological studies. Again, not saying that uh, we can definitively say that uh, these fatty acids decrease our risk of heart disease, but they are associated with a decreased risk of, of cardiovascular disease in, in studies. And of course, in retrospect, it makes total sense. If we start enriching the polyunsaturated fatty acids, the very long chain ones, why would that not happen to the saturated fatty acid ones? And, but that's always with those things. Uh, after the fact, it makes a lot of sense, but this was not on, on my radar, I must admit, uh, uh, recently too, and I, I think not known to a lot of people, because again, if we look at a nutrition flex panel of beef from different systems, we can see that saturated, total saturated fatty acid, and this is also what we found, is was total saturated fatty acid wasn't different between grass fed and grain fed, but the individual saturated fatty acids were very much different, and there's a large number of, of uh, saturated fatty acids, which all the way from four, four uh, carbon chains in length to all the way up to 40. Now, these are typically, uh, you don't detect those in, in beef, but these ones that are, are 20 uh, and, and up, they, uh, yeah, they become enriched uh, quite clearly. And uh, uh, it will be interesting to see if people are fed beef from different uh, systems, whether we can shift some of the saturated fatty acids that, sh that uh, circulate in our blood, because having more of uh, arachidic acid or behenic acid in our blood, people with, that have more of those saturated fatty acids, those long chain ones, uh, have a decreased risk of heart disease. So, and I think this is very, uh, yeah, a very neat and, and uh, important finding in addition to the phytochemicals that uh, uh, was at least not as much appreciated or, or known in the literature. Um, if you still bear with me after all this data, I will spend uh, about five to 10 minutes on animal health markers. In essence, on a molecular level, humans and, and cows are not that different. We're both uh, mammalian species. So if you study the muscle of a, of a human, which we often also do in our lab and look at uh, uh, metabolic health, muscle is the largest organ of our body. It can tell us a lot about sort of the health of, the, of, of our overall system. It's not that different in a, in, in a cow. You can uh, take a piece of their muscle, i.e. meat, and it provides many clues regarding the, the metabolic health of the animal when it, uh, when it was alive, um, or potentially provide some of these, uh, these clues. Oxidative stress markers, and this is something we found in the past. So 4-HNE, 4-hydroxynonanol uh, glutathione. In the literature, it is considered a good marker of oxidative stress. In humans, higher levels of 4 h &E is implicated in, in the pathophysiology of many diseases, such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, neurodegenerative diseases. Less studied in the, in, in the contract of cattle. I also don't know if consuming less of this in beef is going to have a beneficial health effects on humans. I have no idea at the moment. It hasn't been studied. But this is again something that provides us with an initial, very interesting line of research to follow up in the future, because we, we find that 4-hydroxyneal uh, neoglutathione uh, is uh, reduced in, in grass-fed beef. So typically we, we find lower amounts, but again, note the, the great variation. And uh, uh, again, this, this could be a potential indicator of uh, of the overall uh, oxidative stress or, or metabolic health of the animal. And uh, as you can see, it's never black and white uh, because yeah, grass-fed beef isn't grass-fed beef and grain-fed beef isn't grain-fed beef. And as hopefully as we get more 
and more samples, we can start to tease out why some of this is. Um, of course, our hypothesis is, is that if the animal has broader dietary diversity, more space to roam, it's, it's more uh, uh, yeah, stress-free that they will have lower levels of, of these markers. And another thing that we can look at, and again, we're looking at uh, sort of at the, at the nexus of animal health and nutrient density. I should highlight, of course, is that it's arbitrary to separate out nutrient density and, uh, and, and animal health, because first and foremost, all these metabolites that I presented in the nutrient density aspect, uh, the animal that picks it up from the forage, metabolizes it, does so first and foremost for their own health, of course. But from several of these compounds, we can obtain uh, health benefits. So, but advanced glycation end products, advanced glycation end products, especially N6 carboxymethylysine, which is most studied, um, as probably one of you know, the uh, uh, World Health Organization uh, considers uh, red meat a potential carcinogen. And I won't have to go too deep into, into whether uh, uh, that's based upon, but I just want to highlight is that that is considered a reason why uh, red meat is a potential carcinogen. And what is interesting to find is that again, we find a lot of variation amongst uh, animals here with some samples being lower in these compounds than others. Um, we didn't find a statistically significant difference between grass-fed and grain-fed, though maybe it was slightly trending lower for grass-fed. Um, but that is, uh, yeah, that is, I think, another important finding that uh, that uh, this compound, so we look at beneficial compounds, but that potentially harmful compounds also are uh, differentially altered in, uh, in, in grass-fed and grain-fed. And um, But again, here, there's a, there's a large variation between samples, which as we get more data, are hopefully starting to tease some of those out. Glucose metabolic health in the, um, we find no clear differences, at least on an average level. Um, if we look at sugars, typically when uh, some of these are uh, enriched, uh, such as glucose, uh, glucose 6-phosphate, sucrose, we consider that, that there's a little bit poorer glucose metabolic health. But here, as you can see, the picture is not that clear because uh, this is again grass divided by grain. Some of these are uh, more favorable in grass, and some of these are uh, negative in, uh, or, or considered less favorable in grass, in, gr in grass fed samples, I should say, and more favorable in grain, and vice versa. So there's not really a clear picture that, uh, that, that we can conclude for this at the moment. And uh, if, if anything, I would conclude that. Uh, um, as far as the glucose metabolic health, mitochondria, the, the life of the cell was, was no difference between grass fed and grain fed samples. But again, we find this, uh, this range that, uh, that we need to start understanding and, and seeing if there are some differences. Because I do want to highlight is that uh, we had a, a variety of, of feedlots in there with, with different amounts of space, with different amount of, uh, of, of the amount of corn that they were fed. So um, again, as we broaden our data set, maybe we can start teasing out some of these effects where uh, uh, perhaps more physical activity, uh, even in, in, in a confined system, could benefit some of those uh, mitochondrial effects, which is actually a controlled study that we're, we hope to do uh, uh, next year. Conclusions and directions. So far, of course, based on our pilot data, grass-fed beef contains two X more phytochemicals. These phytochemicals are directly picked up from uh, the forages. So cows are what they eat, much like uh, we are to an extent. But there's variation among grass-fed samples, which is 9x, which is a very large variation. So uh, in other words, individual samples may contain nine times more phytochemicals than the least phytochemically rich samples. This could be due to seasonality or pasture diversity. Health benefits, uh, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. Uh, again, we need to study this more in the context of grass-fed beef, but our initial findings that these uh, phytochemicals are becoming altered, even in a larger data set, that there are differences is, is yeah, something very interesting and, and something we will follow up with human nutrition trials. Health benefits, and, and also I should mention that also for, for animal health, right? One of the reasons why animals probably could have less oxidative stress is because they have more of these antioxidants uh, in there. So even if it doesn't provide a direct health benefit to humans, it can 
provide the direct health benefit uh, to animals, as we, we've seen with uh, having more phytochemicals in grass fed and less oxidative stress in grass fed. Um, but again, there's large variation amongst that. If uh, animals are grazing, uh, overgrazing a monoculture pasture, for instance, then maybe uh, the, the oxidative stress in, in the grass fed animals might go up as well. Health benefits, um, as we see lab based models, so in the studies in humans healthier saturated fatty acid profile, quote unquote, I really don't uh, always like using that word because it's, it's, it's not that black and white, but saturated fat, very long chain saturated fatty acids, they're associated with a decreased risk of, of heart disease, they become enriched. Omega-3 fatty acids also become enriched, which could have potent health benefits. Uh, we do find a benefit for vitamin B2 and B3, uh, benefit for vitamin B5 with grain fat. Um, legumes are a rich source of B vitamins and corn is also rich in B5. So grazing corn stalks or providing some, some corn potentially during, uh, during, during winter feeding may, may have a place. I also want to highlight this, and this is so important, is, is that yes, as compared to grain fat, grass fat seems to accumulate additional health promoting phytochemicals. But that does not mean that grain finished beef is therefore unhealthy. There's tremendous variation among systems. And we know that by available protein, Heme iron, zinc, various B vitamins are still provided in, in considerable amounts, even in, in grain fed beef. So, but what we are finding is additional health promoting compounds, specifically related to the forage and these fatty acids, are uh, directly leading to more phytochemicals and antioxidants in grass fed beef, potentially providing additional uh, benefits. This is something even that we could improve, potentially improve in, uh, as we notice, corn is not rich in phytochemicals at all. But if we feed potato peels, almond uh, uh, byproducts, potentially uh, this will be a difference in, in feedlot systems. So what will we investigate with more data points? Seasonality, species diversity. Our initial data suggests the benefits for species diversity, but we need more data for, for to either disprove or, or, or sort of uh, uh, improve upon that or, or at least feel more comfortable in, uh, in uh, making that uh, uh, determination. But our initial data does suggest species diversity is key, both for the animal and as the, for the phytochemicals that subsequently appear in the meat. We do find some initial benefits with healthier soils, more phytochemicals in the forage, more uh, uh, Linoleate in, in the forage as well. So the precursor to DHA and EPA, the omega-3 fatty acids, so more omega-3s, the plant version of omega-3 in the forage leads to more of that in the animal. Of course, that makes sense. And uh, there's a transfer of these nutrients from forage to animal. And this is key. And this is key is that these findings cannot be determined from a nutrition facts panel, which you know we, we didn't don't find any difference in total protein and fat. So if we have uh, different grass-fed samples next to each other, different grain-fed samples next to each other, we could not determine that there's this incredible variation because this does not appear on these nutrition facts panels. Oftentimes, we only find vitamin A, vitamin C, calcium, and iron. Those are, uh, as we see, we do find retinol in, uh, in grass-fed beef. Uh, we actually also detect low amounts of vitamin C in, in grass-fed beef, but uh, oftentimes calcium, uh, we, yeah, it, it, it does not appear. Um, but we do find substantial differences in fatty acids. We find difference in phytochemicals and we find difference in, in, in other advanced uh, glycation end products. So these foods contain hundreds of nutrients that do not appear on nutrition facts panels. And broadly, we did find that uh, of those 700 compounds, about 300 were different between grass fed and grain fed. So this is not, but this story is not told at the moment with, uh, with nutrition facts panels, um, which, I know it's, it's challenging whether you can uh, put all that information on there, but um, that is something to, to consider. And as we get more data, then uh, uh, hopefully this, uh, this can also uh, inform food policy and of course, conveying this information to consumers. Finally, thank you so much for, for attending. Um, if you are interested, uh, bionutrientinstitute.org slash beef. Um, we are running this, this study for uh, yeah, for probably next grazing season as well, but you can send in samples at, at any time and uh, also potentially even freezer beef that you have. So feel free to, uh, to go to the website and uh, if you're interested in participating. And finally, the acknowledgement, I'm simply just a messenger. 
I could have not done this work without a whole a host of people at various institutions. Um, and of course the, the uh, various foundations and uh, partners that have contributed uh, to, to this work. And uh, I know it's, it's too much to, to name you all and I apologize if I forgot everyone, but I'm very grateful for, for all your support because uh, like I said, uh, I'm, I'm merely the messenger here because there's a lot of work that, uh, that goes behind the scenes and, uh, and with a fantastic team, we're able to, uh, to pull this data together. With that, I uh, like to end uh, the, the presentation and, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have or, or feedback that you, uh, that you may have. Thank you so much. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Stefan. That was a, a tour de force. And uh, I know when we talked about this presentation last week, you said, Nah, it'll be half an hour and I don't want to say too much. Engage me and like, we'll, we'll, we'll see. But I, I think that was really powerful. Um, we've got a, a bunch of questions in the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> wonderful community people attending from all over the world. Um, I'm sure many will, will view this afterwards. I'm just going to try to um, pull together, I think, three different points into one. Um, reading the questions and knowing what's going on in the field. Uh, variation is the point. Yeah. Variation is the point. It's, it, the variation is massive and it's not just breastfed versus grain fed. So there's a couple of things there. One of them is 90 to 120 days is the length of time at which their body shifts. And so if it's going into a grain fed operation 100% and it's only 30 days in, it's gonna be much higher. And that also depends on how it was raised. I like the beautiful metaphor of organic coming from the organic world and saying, you know, organic varies a lot and it's generally maybe a little bit better than conventional, but conventional varies a lot. It's not about organic versus conventional. It's not about grass fed versus grain fed. It's about the, the health of the system. And so the second point would be people that are operating in a, a, a CAFO system of some sort, you know, you're talking about uh, grape, grape peels along with the, yeah, potato you know, peels, which we do have up here in Idaho, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can do all, I mean, <clears throat> there's all kinds of things you can give your cows, even in a confined operation that'll keep them healthier and give them some more space to run around. But you can do a pretty good job in a, in a feedlot. So that's a really important point. Um, but then finally, it's about the people who are taking part in this process and being able to make those claims. Um, you know, we're involved in some meta- we're going to define nutrient density in beef. And they're like, can I put something on my label right now that would <laughs> show a few things? So, I mean, I think that's a, that's a maybe a, a place to start, but uh, my recommendation yesterday was, I'm not sure that what Stefan's doing will give you USDA certified numbers. And if it doesn't, and you want to get them, you should send a sample to the USDA and see based on what's on the side panel, what's in your thing. So that would be one simple way, but I think what we're doing is something more significant and yeah. Let me start there, but also I think those are two key points about the amount of time off pasture and the what's what's there when they're not on pasture. Yeah, and in the next in the next yeah. round, that's such an important point. In the next round, we also have samples now for animals that were on uh, feedlot for thirty days. Yeah, uh, so that could you know either, I think there's definitely a role for that and uh, yeah. even uh, grain finishing on pasture, right? If uh, I think it's a great way of upcycling byproducts, but yeah. Sometimes as humans, we, we take something that's, uh, that's, you know, can be very beneficial, but we just got to maybe find a middle ground in that. Yeah. And the data will show and people can make their claims as they wish. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. Any other comments on those two, you know, factors that seem to be the key drivers in these results or the variation itself? Are you going to talk about that? Yeah. I mean, the variation, I mean, again... I know I sound like a scientist because there, we always say we need more data, but uh, I think we need more data to really be sure of it. But what we're seeing, especially what's clear in, in, in the fatty acids in particular, is that yes, farmers that uh, graze more biodiverse pastures, leave plenty of forages, um, they uh, have good resting periods. They were the, the ones with, with the most favorable omega-6 to 3 ratio. Yeah, that, that's what we can see. So that, that's what, we, uh, what, we, what we're clearly finding. And also with the forages, yeah, we find more phytochemicals in the forages, we find more in the meat. And 
of course that that makes sense right if you think about it because it has to come from somewhere but uh yeah that had to my knowledge at least not been studied uh, uh, to this extent so it's, it's nice that we're at least starting to tease out some of those relationships but uh, i'm happy to go over some of the some of the questions that uh, some of the individuals had in the, in the chat do you want to answer them directly absolutely so uh, yeah. Bill, Bill Grayson had a question, how do you test the vegetation if the cattle are grazed in a mixed habitat with trees and bushes that they browse? That's a very good question. What uh, we typically do when we go to the farm is we observe the animals and what they eat. And the farmer can typically tell us because they see the animals day in and day out. So uh, we have certainly collected things like wild onions or uh, plucked leaves off of uh, trees uh, to analyze those. So what we typically do is, is based on observation of the farmer, observation of the animal, we collect samples that are roughly representative of what they have access to and what they can consume. But of course, the limitation is, is that we don't know exactly what they consume unless we sit there for, uh, for, for 12 hours uh, and, and seeing exactly how much they, uh, they, they consume of each. But um, we do know that, that cattle, especially when they're adapted to the local ecosystem, uh, consume, uh, we often think of cattle as early grazers, but when uh, uh, properly adapted to the ecosystem, yes, they, are. they can also be browsers and they can indeed uh, nibble on, on leaves of trees and, and uh, sagebrush uh, and things like that. So we, we try to capture that by creating, a, so these samples that you saw from the forage, it basically is a sample homogenate that we collected on the field or the farmer collected on the field, roughly representative of what the animal uh, consumed and had access to within the last 30 days of slaughter. Um, Another question from, from Brian Sobo is, did all the grass-fed steaks come from grassland pasture or were there any that uh, gray savanna silver pasture? We uh, did have one or two where there was uh, trees integrated. Um, and again, uh, hard to say based on a few samples what we're seeing, but that's definitely something we're interested in more. So we also have samples in there of animals uh, grazing uh, mountain pastures or public rangelands, right? So there are non-irrigated pastures, typically less grasses, but more forbs and shrubs, uh, wildflowers uh, that are consumed. So it was a combination of, uh, of, of both. And, uh, but yeah, at this point we see this variation and, and maybe that could uh, uh, determine some of that. What we typically see is without making too bold of a claim is that um, we do know that, that some of these uh, and you can certainly have that also in a, in a sown pasture, but in sort of more rainsland pastures or savanna pastures, more untouched pastures, we see that there's greater plant diversity. Um, notice any correlation between uh, number of days on grain and, and nutrient density um, by Ashley Sweeting. All the data that we had here was from uh, animals that were finished for 90 to 120 days. We are now adding data where animals were finished only for 30 days. So a really brief period on uh, grains. What we found is, is that we had some, some smaller feedlots in there as well that fed less corn and more hay. And those, as, as we saw clearly from the data, being more phytochemicals in the hay translates to a bit more phytochemicals in the beef. So grain-fed beef isn't grain-fed beef. And if there's a little bit more uh, phytochemically rich feed uh, being fed to animals, and this can also be a combination of meadow hay or alfalfa hay, again, biodiversity, we see that that also has a benefit on, on the grain fat. Um, Jim Lin asks, are you able to detect any metabolites of herbicides or pesticides? In our analysis, uh, we have the, that they are not looking at herbicides and pesticides uh, as much at the moment. Now that is certainly something that is, that is of interest to us. And um, we're always adding more metabolites to our, to our database. And uh, we can also potentially go back and, and reanalyze samples uh, because there's many unknowns. I didn't present, I presented to you several hundred compounds, but we also have many unknowns that they're different, but I have no idea what the compound is at the moment. So we've been, we're adding uh, more metabolites to our database. So that, that is something that is definitely on our radar, but uh, at the moment we, uh, we have not looked into that in depth. Um, 
here the next question is how moisture and fermentation affects nutrient density uh, with, with uh, uh, silage. Um, and indeed, it could help uh, determine the best practice for winter feeding of forage. Um, uh, that's from Matt Meyer, and it's, it's, it's a good point. I mean, I agree is that, you know, the, the nature of uh, pasture-based farming is, is that, yeah, you're, you're going to have winter and, and not have many fresh forages. So you might see a, a slight decrease in, in the phytochemicals. Potentially, if you have a lot of phytochemicals during the grazing season or during the, uh, in the cow-calf phase of the, of the animal, right, young animal, if they start high, in the fall, there's probably less of a drop during the winter as well. And um, indeed, that is uh, uh, something, different types of, of, of uh, silage and different types of, uh, of fermentation could affect nutrient density. It's, it's a very good good point. And I'm not sure if anyone has looked at it as in depth, um, but that is uh, definitely a good, uh, a good USDA grant, uh, Matt. So thank you for that. Um, uh, so were your pasture short-term sown lays or unplowed permanent grassland? Uh, a lot of it had been had been permanent grassland for for a long time. Although some samples were um, were converted in in the last few years to uh, from cropping systems to uh, uh, forage to forages to pasture system, and we we do see that you initially you have. Probably in the broader literature, you might have a jump in soil organic matter. You see more biodiverse plants coming back, um, but not 100% sure. A again, um, something that, uh, that is another avenue of research is that, okay, if you recently converted uh, croplands to pasture, is your beef going to be more phytochemically rich over time as you uh, bring back bio plant biodiversity? My guess would be yes. But I have, uh, that would be my hypothesis, but I, I cannot say uh, for, for sure. Um, DPA is not included. That is right. I did not include uh, uh, the cost of pentanoic acid. Um, an important reason why we can uh, see EPA uh, increase in the blood of humans more so than can be expected purely based on the EPA uh, content of the meat is because we readily convert DPA to EPA in our blood. So indeed, it's a good point by Bill Grayson if that uh, DPA um, is included in the N63 ratio actually, but I did not highlight it uh, specifically as, as standalone, but only highlighted DHA and EPA. Um, but we found similar magnitude of differences in DPA. So. Um, we did measure it in, in our study. Um, we measured a large number. So the omega-6 fatty acids is also a large number of uh, different, uh, different types of fatty acids in there. Um, Melissa Larson asks, based on preliminary results, finding some nutrient density variation uh, between grass fat and grain fat, how would you recommend enhancing future nutrition facts panels to reflect the variations? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, Borrowing this from a little bit from like, for instance, salmon, right? On salmon, oftentimes if we if I buy salmon, especially when it's packaged, it would say X hundred milligrams of DHA or EPA or X hundred milligrams of omega-3 fatty acids in here. Um, it's obviously non-FDA verified claim, but potentially there is an opportunity in the future as we get uh, to put something like that on, uh, on, on packaging, but that again, that's why I think this project is important, is uh, that would need to move the needle on, uh, on, on food policy, right? And, and certainly the variation, I know it's something that's of interest uh, to, uh, to USDA and FDA to understand that, that variation, because we know that a carrot isn't a carrot isn't a carrot, right? And you pick up a carrot and it says X amount of vitamin A, uh, but it's, uh, there can be a, 10x variation in it, and the same with beef. So how, how do we go about this is that I'd say, if you know it about your meat and with testing, then potentially this is something you can uh, put in blogs, put it in your website. Whether you can put it on a label, uh, yeah, I wouldn't rule it, wouldn't rule it out in the future uh, that uh, uh, perhaps you can't put a non-verified claim on there, uh, provided <clears throat> it's evidence-based. So I don't well, know if you, you have a thoughts about it then. Yeah, because it was Melissa that I was talking to about this yesterday. It was the reason I brought it up. Um, and they were talking about eggs. And I said, we don't have a data set for eggs. 
and we should build one. And we can, if we get 10 farmers to put in five grand each or people, we can build a, a variation data set to do this complete metabolomics and define nutrient density. Yeah. Or you could send your eggs to the lab that the USDA certifies and see what's in your eggs above what the USDA says. And then, I mean, put that claim. So the tricky really part is so, yeah. the growers to be able to make claims. Yeah. And it's we're doing this complicated thing, but let's find the all the steps in between, which yeah. is, I'll say, you know, part of our conversation at the conference. So Stefan, you're gonna be, you know, keynoting speaking significantly in December at our conference here in Massachusetts. But day three is about this, what is nutrient density and how do we convey it and how do we, you know, assess it and market it and and share it openly and honestly. Um, so yeah. I think it's a very important point, Dan. And indeed, if you and that's that's a tricky part now, right? It's like, okay, we put fat on there, carbohydrates and sugar, you know, saturated fat, yeah. protein, and then usually only four uh, uh, vitamins and minerals. Yeah. Vitamin A, C, iron, and calcium. If you send it, you can probably get a broader one, but then you only end up with 13. So if you send it to USDA, you can get the USDA uh, labeling on there, but it, you might not find a difference between you know your, your, your store fat one. We don't find a difference in protein. We have sent many of these samples in for total fat, for saturated yeah. fat, for protein. There's no difference. Yeah. But if we then look at sort of the, we peel back the onion layer, yeah, then if you look at individual compounds, then all of a sudden total saturated fat, same, but the type of saturated fatty acids is different. Yeah. The phytochemicals is not something that, uh, and, and I know that it's experimental and, and that's also what we're doing. I should highlight that what we're doing is experimental, right? Uh, uncharted territories, but we have to start somewhere. And we have to start with defining the edges of the continuum and seeing what it is and where it is and what causes it. And yeah. I mean, at this point, we've got enough samples to say, it verifies what you saw before there, you know, the variation is significant. You know, you were doing 10 X and 15 X and 20 X on some of these metabolite families. Um, it's, you know, it's real. So yeah, that's part of the conversation is how do we, you know, come up with a framework to be able to share what we're doing to those who are being part of it, paying for it or being part of the project and getting results they want to be able to put out publicly. How do we facilitate that? Yeah, and in an honest and, and, and a transparent way, and uh, I agree. Um, a, a few more questions I'll try to go, go yeah. through. I see uh, Kyle Harper and uh, Michelle Thorney had a similar question about uh, toxins or things like glyphosate and uh, um, what are the impact on the health of, of animal and humans is detectable. It's not something we have uh, particularly looked at. Using mass spec, we could uh potentially test for that in the future yes um whether this has a appreciable effect on human health i i and uh from the animal yeah i, I don't think it's, it's not no we do know about pcbs and things like that yeah they can be in in in, in pasture too oftentimes as well and uh, they're uh depending on how the land was managed in the past microplastics another thing is that yeah we find microplastics on uh, in, in polar bears in, in the in the arctics right so it's unfortunately everywhere um these are are things that we have not looked at but and and i'm not sure if they're if what the variation is between uh between samples uh um so well, the only thing i can tell you is that the corn samples that we tested yes they were conventionally managed uh, uh and and oftentimes uh, well they, they had herbicide uh, treatment yes um silage corner otherwise in play in any of the systems and is silage more phytochemically enriched um compared to silage versus maybe hay um initial work um, we, we do not find the differences there between silage and, and hay they're, they're both so let's say if you take uh Let's say you take alfalfa or, or pasture grass from your pasture and you you turn it into 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 hay or, or, or silage then you see a threefold reduction in, in phytochemicals from that same pasture as opposed to feeding it fresh to the animal so uh um i know it is uh something that we have to deal with uh but if you're able and, and depending on on the pasture that you're at, able to you know have also several cool season grasses and can 
uh, extend time on pasture, I, I think that would be considered a favorable thing. And uh, um, that, that is, yeah, that is about what, uh, what I can say about, uh, about that at the moment. So this uh, is uh, another question from Dara uh, Kotkin uh, regarding nutrition facts. Yes, uh, out of 700, 300 are different or so. Uh, no, no, not all of them are, uh, are phytonutrients. We did find a lot of difference in phytonutrients, also a lot of fatty acids, uh, certain amino acids. We also measure a large number of lipid species, and that's really our, also where we find the difference. So you, there's thousands of lipid species, and oftentimes they're related to those uh, fatty acids, omega-3, omega-6 fatty acids, but you have many derivatives of that. So um, or glycine conjugate. So without getting too deep into it, is that if you, you have different lipid species that have are omega-3, omega-6, so if you have 10 of these of omega-3s, then yes, all, all 10 are, are rich. So, but it is telling uh, oftentimes the, the sort of uh, a, a similar picture in, in that regard. But I do want to highlight is that the largest difference that we found, yes, they were in the phytochemicals. That's really where, where we see this direct relationship with the forage. Great. I just, um, we've got uh, four minutes left, Stefan, and I'd like to give you time to just make any, any closing comments. It's been great, all the attendees and the questions. Um, maybe we can, Stefan can answer the rest of the questions later, and that can be a, a, an added bonus with recording for everyone. Um, but yeah, I mean, as this project goes forward, um, from a very timely standpoint, we have some money from some of those funders that um, Stefan put in that slide before for growers to send in samples. And we're working globally now, um, multiple continents, and um, the next sample run is October 1st. So it's a very short time window for those who want to get in soon uh, where we can guarantee the money. But um, if you go to that URL Stefan gave you, bioinstitute.org slash beef, um, engaging is totally, um, yeah, a real-time opportunity to be part of this. We're hoping to run a couple hundred samples, say in October, and then have a much larger data set with more um, insights digested. And um, that's you know what we're gonna be having you speak to at the conference in December here in Massachusetts. Um, but again, this whole broader question of how do we roll it out? How do we empower people to make claims honestly and it's part of a collective openly is, you know, why we're so excited to be doing this project because beef is such an important crop on the planet. Um, and if we do it with one, we can do it with many. Yeah. Um, that's where we're going to go next year. So just yeah. in, the, in the two minutes we've got left, any, any closing comments? And well, I, I want to, I want to highlight, and I saw John Cox, who was a partner of the study also asked the question. So we, uh, it was a lot of data. So, so, so bear with us, but, um, there's about four or five people working on this, uh, but we are going to send out individual project reports in the in the yeah. next uh, month or so. So everyone who participated to the study will have all their individual data reports to sort of uh, uh, the average that I, uh, I showed you to yeah. or to benchmark. And those of sending grass-fed and grain-fed samples, we will uh, obviously uh, provide you with individual samples. Um, but it's uh, it's it's a lot of data, a lot of uncharted territory that we went in, uh, which is yeah. I think fantastic. But it's, uh, I must say, it's a lot of data so, that we have to work through. So we'll, we'll continue to work on that. And so we provide you basically with a PowerPoint, uh, a project report, and, and then a list of all compounds with the very difficult names that uh, I must say, half of them, I don't even know what they do. So. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Stefan. It's, it's an honor to work with you and very excited to be you know, cutting, cutting new ground here with you, as it were. That's not a horrible metaphor. But yes. <laughs> no, th thanks so much, Dan. And also, I want to highlight this fast is that, okay, without farmers, right, we, not, we would not be doing this work without dedicated farmers. So I, I'm, I want to highlight that uh, is that uh, I, I really like my job. Um, and uh, so I'm grateful for, uh, for the farmers that are willing to contribute uh, because uh, that, that means that we are able to do some of this work. And, uh, and you know, hopefully, it will, uh, it will be a benefit. So thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you all. <laughs>